So last week, we looked at uh, Philip and Andrew and Thomas and Nathaniel, and uh, what we recognized was that they all served in the background. And we know little about them, but what we do learn is a lot about Jesus in the process of looking at them. So I stressed <clears throat> that these apostles appear to serve in the shadows, but I also stress that they are of significance to Jesus and to his ministry. Jesus meets them where they're at, just like he meets us where we're at. He begins to use them as they are, and he puts his finger on what's holding them back. And he does this so he can reveal to them what it is that we need to move forward with Jesus. So tonight we're going to add a few more names. We're going to add the names of James the Less, of Thaddeus, of Simon the Zealot, uh, to the list of these background servants that we know little about. Starting with James, James the Less. Um, his name uh, may signify uh, that he's different than the other James, who is the brother of John that we uh, mentioned on the first night. Uh, it could also mean that he was small in stature, or it could even mean that he was young. Uh, we really don't know for sure. He is listed in the Bible, but he actually doesn't have any words attributed to him anywhere in written scripture. But we do know that he was called by Jesus he responded to Jesus, he served him, he walked with him, Jesus trained him, and he received apostleship. He was sent out. That's all I have to offer on James. But even that is so significant, even though I don't have much to share with you, it was significant to Jesus, to our Lord. Thaddeus is also somewhat of a mystery, and even more so because he has several different names. It makes it a bit more complicated. Scripture refers to him as Thaddeus, um, but also by two other names, Labaius, and his original name, his birth name is Judas, which is what Waylon mentioned to us. I must be watching too many detective shows because I really feel that Jesus went and took him out of a protective program somewhere and brought him to, uh, to save him. Um, but actually, uh, you know, John MacArthur has some better insight than I can offer on that. Um, he says that these nicknames, Labaius, translate as heart child. Thaddeus translates as breast child. So these were possibly names of family endearment, uh, indicating that Thaddeus was a gentle soul, perhaps, you know, tender kind of guy, childlike heart. Made me think of the beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Thaddeus saw God up close and personal in the form of Jesus Christ. Thaddeus does have some words recorded, and they're in uh, the book of John. And it was during the Last Supper, Thaddeus says, Lord, why are you going to re reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? So Jesus answers him, and he says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So at first glance, it kind of sounds simple. As I thought more about it, it really became very more, much more profound in its message. In this exchange, I believe that Thaddeus was met by Jesus where he needed to be met, where Thaddeus needed to be met. Jesus was putting his finger on something that Thaddeus needed to understand. Jesus is letting him know, and letting us know, I believe, in the process, that our love for God is expressed through obedience. Those were the clear and direct words of Jesus. That makes love and obedience inseparable for followers of Christ. Those who love and obey God are his children. As his children, we receive the Holy Spirit, who then reveals Christ to us, but Christ remains hidden to the rest of the world who does not obey. It saddens me. And I think, I think if you think of children who are disobedient, how sad that makes you feel. So it's my opinion that Thaddeus, because of his tender, loving nature, that he has a feeling of love for Jesus. And Jesus is saying, Thaddeus, you need to go beyond that, beyond that feeling into action. Our inward feelings of love need to move to outward acts of love. 
And then we begin to see that love and obedience and serving are not just options, or they're not good suggestions. They're fundamental to a relationship with Jesus, but they're also fundamental to any relationship that we want to engage in. So a beautiful picture of this for me is when Jesus restores Peter on the beach. It's described by John. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me three times? Peter says, yes, three times, of course I love you. And each time Jesus responds, the first time he says, Jesus, um, feed my lambs. The second time Jesus says, tend my sheep. And the third time he responds with, feed my sheep. Those are acts that Jesus is asking. And what's interesting is he's not asking it for himself, saying, if you love me, you will do this for others. So perhaps Thaddeus, a gentle person, maybe even a bit shy, didn't know that he was holding back from fully loving Jesus in the way that Jesus wanted to be loved. He didn't yet understand that fully loving Jesus requires serving Jesus. So Jesus spoke words of truth and abundant life into Thaddeus' life. For some of us, do we need to hear those words spoken into our life? Is it possible that sometimes we stop short at feeling love and feeling gratitude for what the Lord has done for us, but we're holding back a bit from serving Jesus as our Lord? We can apply the sacrificial serving love in how we love others. Those of us who are husbands are to love our wives this way. We can't tell our wives that we love them, or we can tell our wives that we love them, but don't we need to show them in acts, with words, not just in our minds? We have a marriage ministry here at Reliance with marriage mentors that help us all better understand how we can love our wives as we are learning better to love Jesus. So before moving on to Simon the Zealot and Matthew, I'd like to wrap up with a few points of application about all of these lesser apostles. Um, number one, perhaps there's times where we're not feeling bold enough to step out. You can trust in the Holy Spirit to help you. You can trust your brothers in Christ to be there to help you. Sometimes we're feeling that we're not good enough. We've seen this in some of the apostles. Not good enough to serve. It doesn't depend on our skills depends on our availability and our willingness. Jesus makes this clear as he works with these apostles that we've seen. And the third thing is, sometimes maybe a job just might look too small to us, too un unimportant. What difference could it make? So this is an opportunity to serve and be intimate with Jesus as we do this kind of work. And this way we can be intimate with Jesus and not worry about being in the spotlight of man. Serving humbly and anonymously in the background allows Jesus to shine. So John the Baptist teaches us this lesson. And again, the book of John I'm going to go to. He describes, uh, John describes a time when there was a dispute between his followers and the followers of Jesus. Jesus, they, the concern was from John's followers that, look, Jesus is taking your disciples away. So John the Baptist responds to him and he says uh, to his followers, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. And he ends this passage, that's just the way he opens it, he ends it by saying, he must increase, I must decrease. So I think those are words of encouragement for all of us who live lives serving in obscurity, in the background, behind the scenes. So I urge you to look for ways to serve Jesus and don't think that they're beneath us in any way. Don't think that they're out of sight. Another example here at Reliance is we have a men's discipleship ministry. There's several of you who are participating in that and do a wonderful job. So these men will all work quietly in the background, working one-on-one -on -one with other men who need to come into growth with Christ and grow out of their circumstances that they're experiencing. Each of these men get to see lives transformed by Jesus. It's an amazing sight to see. So all of our lesser-known apostles that we talked about, they got to see all of that happening, too. And we can see that. Our last pair of apostles, um, Simon the Zealot and Matthew. And although Simon the Zealot belongs with this lesser group of apostles, if you will, lesser-known, not lesser men, not lesser apostles, I've saved him for the last because he's going to be an interesting comparison, I think, 
to what we're going to see in Matthew. And Matthew actually starts to move us into the better known apostles that we're more familiar with. So Simon is not to be confused with Simon Peter, and he is about as obscure as James the Less. He has no words recorded. He's only mentioned in the places where all the lists of apostles do occur, and there's no other information that I could discover about him. But what we do have to draw from is his name, Simon the Zealot. Uh, he was likely a member of the Zealot political party in Israel. Zealots were ardent nationalist supporters of Israel. They were dedicated to removing Rome from Israel. The religious establishment, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they also wanted Rome out, but they weren't as extreme as the Zealots were, and they viewed the Zealots as fanatics who often resorted to violence if necessary. So in Israel, these zealots, they placed an emphasis on national support, national endeavors over and above God's agenda. Just put God's agenda aside. So let's briefly compare the life of Simon the Zealot to the life of Matthew. So you likely recall that Matthew was a tax collector before he became a disciple. Tax collectors were seen as very sinful people. We, seem to know this. Even today, we <laughs> probably consider the IRS in that vein. Sorry, that wasn't in my script. Um, that even, uh, you know, spending time with any of these tax collectors would just tarnish your reputation. You couldn't even be seen. You'd be one of them, perceived as one of them. Um, now, as a tax collector, this means that Matthew worked for Rome. That was his job. And if you can picture this, right, Simon is opposed to Rome. He wants Rome out, but yet Matthew is benefiting from the presence of Rome there. Uh, both also were on the fringes of society, right? I mean, extreme on one side, sinner on the other side. So the majority of people just look down on both of them. So it's from this contrast and also from the commonality that we can draw some powerful observations. Both lived their lives reacting to the challenges that they experienced in society at that time, in the day and age that they lived. Each man was only understood and accepted by a small group of people on opposite ends of the spectrum, and they were rejected by the larger majority in the middle. So imagine how Simon the Zealot might view Matthew. At best, a traitor. Certainly would want to do him harm, might even want to kill the guy. Um, how would Matthew view Simon? Uh, he's probably pretty uncomfortable. I would think that fear and uh, lack of trust would be at the top of his lust, uh, list. What would he, what's he going to do to me? But what they had in common, again, was that they were looked down upon by the religious establishment and most of society. The miracle here is that Jesus was able to embrace both men, get his arms around both guys. They were vastly different, but they were able to follow Jesus. And they were unified into a common belief under Jesus. Both men had been zealous for something, okay? Simon was zealous for national pride. Matthew was zealous for wealth and money. Now, they were all in for Jesus. They changed the things that they were zealous for into the things that they should be jealous, uh, zealous for, Jesus. So it was no longer the differences that separated any of them, just like in this room. The differences that we may experience go away as we come together and we unite under Jesus. So Jesus is an incredible leader just on that, just on that alone. That's the kind of leader I want to follow. That's the kind of leader I do follow. So guys, what might, might we be zealous for? Are we zealous for Jesus? Do we have competing endeavors? So I was at Petco Park in 2006, and it was a time when they clinched their division championship. And it, they did it in dramatic fashion. It was the last day of the season. The crowd went crazy. Everybody jumped to their feet, screaming, yelling, cheering, waving their arms. I jumped up too. I, mean, I was just caught up in the energy of it all. It was pretty amazing. But as I stood there, I looked around, and I kind of, to me, it reminded me of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem at Passover and how the crowds there were all 
compassionate with hosannas, loving Jesus, welcoming him, standing up, cheering, throwing down palm. And it just led after that to why don't these 40,000 people jump up for Jesus? Guys, we should be jumping on our feet for Jesus. When we consider the work that he's done, the work that he's doing, the good news of the gospel, the work that he's going to do, cheering for his second coming. So we are faced with challenges in our society today. We know that. We see political division. We look for political solutions. And it saddens me that many believers seem to be more committed to a political party or a political point of view or a social cause of any kind more than they are to Jesus Christ, to the church, to the gospel, to the kingdom of God. <clears throat> because of their greater allegiance to Jesus, Matthew and Simon the Zealot were brothers and co-workers for the saving grace of the gospel. So how do you react to the challenges we face today? Where's your allegiance? The apostles were loyal to Jesus and turned to Jesus with their doubts and struggles and with their questions. And when they needed answers, they turned to Jesus for those answers. So do we turn to Jesus for those answers when we struggle? When you talk into your groups tonight, you're going to talk about political problems or you're going to talk about Jesus and turning to Jesus? I hope it's about Jesus and not about politics. Let's look at Matthew. Matthew turned to Jesus. As a result, he was transformed. He was no longer conformed to the role that he had in society. And we can see this transformative power of Jesus as we look deeper into the life of Matthew. And he's primarily known for two things, his gospel, which is awesome, and for his dramatic calling. So first, I'm going to take a look at the scholarly aspect of Matthew's gospel. These aren't my words. I'm not a Bible scholar, but I'll share what I've dug up. As the first book of the New Testament, Matthew is a joining link to the Old Testament with a focus on fulfilling prophecy. There are more than 60 quotations from the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The majority of these quotations are found in Jesus' teachings. Matthew's gospel contains more of Jesus' teachings than any of the other gospels. He was accurate recorder and a keen observer of people as he captured very small details. His gospel provides clear picture and depth into the life of Jesus. So I'm going to share a couple of aspects with you of that. And it was written to prove that Jesus is Israel's long-awaited promised Messiah, our Messiah. Matthew also wants to make plain the kingdom of God by using the expression kingdom of heaven 32 times in order to convey a higher sense of spirituality. So we're familiar with many of the passages in Matthew. They're, they're all kind of iconic, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, the Golden Rule, the Great Commission. Now I'll offer my perspective, it's not scholarly, it's pretty simple. To me, the words of the gospel, as we look into Matthew's gospel, we can look into Matthew's heart. And when we see Matthew's heart, we're going to see the heart of Jesus, because that's what Matthew saw. That's what he was conveying. We can see a transformed heart in Matthew when we compare the before and after of who he was and who he became. So as we talked about him being a tax collector, he was not only despised for collaborating with Rome, but he was also um, kind of a bad guy in collecting excessive taxes. He went over and above what he needed to do so that he could line his own pockets with his own wealth and comfort. As a despised person, his friends were likely similar, tax collectors, thought to be uh, perhaps prostitutes, maybe even thieves. Um, on the fringe of society, with his friends, his job required him as a tax collector to continue to interact with all of the other members of society who were rejecting and despising him. And he had to do that, I would imagine, every day. So in his booth, he sees people <clears throat> who are coming into contact with Jesus, and he's hearing what's going on. He's hearing about miracles. He's hearing about healings. He's hearing the preaching. He's hearing the good news. But he was cast out. He couldn't enter the temple. He couldn't enter the crowds around Jesus. He couldn't be with those who were following Jesus. He had to stand on the sidelines and not be with them. He was lonely, set aside. I'm sure he wanted what everybody else was seeking. 
when you start hearing the excitement about Jesus and what he's done, but he couldn't be part of that. Do you know what it's like to be an outcast? To not fit in, to not be part of the in crowd, to not be part of the clique, the cool kids, to be rejected, to be looked down upon, to be left out. So all people, every one of us want to be accepted. To be included is one of the strongest motivating desires that we have as people. I can relate to this. I mean, there's times, uh, you know, one of my most difficult was during my mid-high years, and probably for men as we're learning how to become men, that could typically be one of the most difficult times. And I can think of times when I was in and times when I was out. There was loneliness. There was awkwardness trying to figure out how to grow into this. Church was actually my most uncomfortable time. Even as an adult, I didn't feel like I fit in. I sat in the pews. I felt like everyone understood what was going on, and they were getting it, and I wasn't. I wanted to understand. I listened to sermons. They sounded good. Sounded like good advice. Sounded like good moral teaching. But I somehow sensed that there was a depth to that that I wasn't getting, that I was missing. So the good news, though, for me was that Unlike Matthew, who couldn't enter the temple, I could enter into Jesus' church, and I could learn. And I was committed to learning about God, so I just kept at it. So this church that I was in had a vision. It said, an encounter with Jesus Christ transforms lives. But I actually wondered, you know, I don't think I've ever met anybody who was transformed by Jesus. I wondered if you could. Um, one day, Jesus called me to follow him. And my world changed, and I never looked back, but I just hung in there. So my calling was not as dramatic, even though I'm not describing the specifics to you. It wasn't as dramatic as Matthew's. Matthew's uh, calling is described in the book of Luke, in the book of Mark, and even Matthew himself describes it. So what do you think it was like for Matthew when Jesus walks up to him? He's an outcast. Nobody would talk to him. Jesus himself walks up to him, and he says, come, follow me. He hears the words. I imagine he stops for a split second. And he's like, what? Me? Who? Me? You're talking to me, Jesus? I don't think it took more than a split second because then he said, yes, I'm in. So just like the other disciples, even though he was the despised tax collector, he was called by Jesus to follow him. This was so significant, so significant, that Matthew left his post. He abandoned the job. I imagine there's some risk if you just bail on Rome. Where's my money? Where's Matthew? And he throws a dinner party in honor of Jesus. And so who do we find at the dinner party? Other tax collectors, other sinners, sordid people. So um, as they're there, um, the Pharisees are questioning Jesus' disciples. And they're questioning him about, you know, gee, do you know what's going on with Jesus? Do you see who he's associating with? Matthew records all of this, and he gives one of the clearest explanations of God's, God's heart. So he, Jesus, said to them, the Pharisees, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Matthew wrote that in chapter 9. Uh, Jesus didn't come to save the good, self-righteous people, but those who were not good, those who admitted they needed salvation. Haven't you found in your experience it's difficult to save somebody who doesn't know that they need salvation, doesn't know that they need a redeemer? It's really tough stuff, isn't it? Matthew recognized it. So Matthew longed to be saved from the life he was living, when called by Jesus, he immediately left his tax collection booth and he followed the Lord. So we can see the heart of Jesus in the Beatitudes also. Uh, it's from, from the Sermon of the Mount. You know, it's kind of helps kick off the Sermon of the Mount. So the Beatitudes essentially means blessings. Uh, we often hear them described as aspirations or as a way to be or as a reward if we attain that attribute or that attitude and we will get something. Um, it also could be viewed as a message of inclusiveness, and I'll explain. As Jesus is teaching his disciples these Beatitudes, because he's focused on the disciples, but he's got crowds around him, and he's saying these words, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. People are sitting there and they're hearing this and they're going, what, me? Just like Matthew in the tax booths. Me? You're asking me? Jesus is pointing out that everyone receives an invitation. Everyone receives an invitation to the kingdom of God. Those who think they are the meek, the rejected, because they are not the powerful or the elite, those who consider too poor in spirit to seek out a rabbi to teach them are also invited. Those who have been told that they're the weak and the have-nots, they have blessings as well. So many of Jesus' followers were from the poor, the rejected, the sick, the sinful, the weary. He never condemned those people. He encouraged them to seek the kingdom of God because it was available to them, just like it's available to us. Jesus' harshest condemnations and words were for the Pharisees, the teachers of the law who thought themselves too good, thought that they were better than everybody else. The tax collectors, the sinners around them, they were better than that. So guys, are there times when we look down on the outcasts of society or do we see them as God sees them, people in need of a savior, just like we need a savior? You know, it helped me tremendously when I got help and I don't even remember the source for this, but it helped when I was able to have somebody share a vision with me that we're all broken people living in a fallen world in need of a savior who can put us together and put this world together. Takes my breath away. So do we see people too far gone and we write them off? Guys, I was 49 years old when the Lord called me. He didn't write me off. I gave him plenty, nine, plenty of years of opportunity to write me off, and he didn't do it. Thank you, Jesus. So Luke and Mark uh, actually call Matthew Levi. And uh, Levi, the son of Alphaeus, was how they refer to him. Matthew means gift of God. So how do we get from Levi to Matthew? Um, it's likely, but I don't think we know. But it's likely that Jesus changed his name from Levi to Matthew in his conversion, in his acceptance of him. And why might that be? Well, Levi means um, gift, gift of God. Isn't that what God's grace is for us? is a gift from God for each and every one of us. We just need to accept it, just like Matthew did. So Matthew knew that the kingdom of God was for him. He heard the call. He never looked back. He left behind his source of wealth. He gave up a position of security and comfort, even though it was working for the Romans. He exchanged that for a life of sacrifice, traveling hardship, eventual martyrdom. He left his old life for a new life, a new life with Jesus. Like Peter, who became a fisher of men, Matthew, instead of collecting taxes, became a collector of souls, working for the Lord. What would we give up to save souls, to save even just one soul? With our commitment to living a life transformed by Jesus, because he's truly transformed our lives, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, our hearts can reflect the heart of Jesus as also. We can also share the glory of the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew did. It's humbling to think that that can be so, but it's true. So I'd like to close with a passage that's been especially meaningful to me all these years. Um, it's from <clears throat> Matthew 9, and uh, it's called, actually, The Compassion of Jesus is the title, um, where they do put titles in that translation. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease Every among the people, every disease, every sickness, not just some, but every. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers to his harvest. So send out, that should sound familiar to us. Uh, our introduction night, Waylon taught us that apostle means one who was sent. And he said in the New Testament, there's two primary usages. One refers to the original 12 apostles. The second refers to other individuals who are to be sent, to be messengers, ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Waylon went on to say, 
That's you and that's me. We have the same calling placed on our lives as those apostles did. So look around you, anywhere you look, at work, in the community, at home, your family, your friends, even in your own homes. Yes, even in your own homes. You will see today people who are weary, people who are scattered, who are lost, who need healing. I don't know about you. I see a harvest that's more plentiful and growing every day. Lost people. It's a virtual bumper crop of lost and hurting people in need of a shepherd. So my guess is that Matthew went on to minister to others who were outcasts just like he was, who thought themselves beyond saving, beyond being of use. Matthew shows us by his life that God can save anyone and will use anyone to help accomplish his work. We shouldn't feel unaccepted or unqualified because of our appearance, any lack of education, or our past, whatever we've done. Jesus looks for sincere commitment. Again, Matthew left everything and was all in. So guys, when we pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest, my hope is that that prayer and that sentiment is accompanied by another prayer, the words of Isaiah. This is where Isaiah said in Isaiah 6, 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I, Isaiah that is, said, here am I, send me. Guys, these words of Isaiah, they convict me, they challenge me, but they also comfort me. If you feel conviction, that's the Holy Spirit gently doing that. Step up to the challenge of that conviction, but also step into the comfort that Jesus Christ has for you and has for all of us.